Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Ellen. And, uh, thanks to Tom and Sonia for, for hosting us every, each and every year. because it's, it's just a special, energizing gathering with folks who, who care about, about Alaska. Thanks to Bernadette and, and Lorraine or, or, for, for traveling from Canada. From, oh, sorry. I'm not loud enough by Usually people tell me to quiet down in the office because I, being a guy from New Jersey, I tend to be a little, a little loud and uh, boisterous. Okay. Any better? My, a little bit better. Um, for, for making the trip uh, all the way down and allowing us the privilege of, of recognizing you this evening. Um, thanks to, to all of you who are supporters of the Last Wilderness League, whether you're donors, uh, activists, supporters, uh, people who are taking action. Uh, thank you for supporting our conservation partners as well who care about Alaska. It's, uh, it's really tremendous to have you here. And thank you for uh, our, our conservation partners who are here this evening as well from, from a whole bunch of different national and local and regional conservation groups. Let me just take a moment to uh, recognize the, the, the couple of my great colleagues at Alaska Learners League. Uh, Chris Koch leads the development team here, and many of my him. Baker, who really carried, did a lot of the heavy lifting to make tonight happen. So, you know, as Ellen said, it, I I started in the job as executive director uh, about a year ago, and so it's really fitting to, to be back here on the uh, more or less the anniversary when I started. Uh, I was drawn to, I had worked at Alaska Wilderness, Wilderness League earlier in my career, and I was really drawn back for a lot of reasons. I mean, one is the opportunity to work at the only national conservation group that is devoted full time to Alaska lands conservation. The opportunity to be on the front lines of these fights in Washington, D.C., and, and really work in that arena. The opportunity to partner with so many great organizations, both in Alaska and nationally, in the cause. But more than anything else, uh, the reason why I, I, I wanted to come back is this incredible community. I mean, incredible community of people that care about these last great wild places in Alaska and the Arctic. There's something special about people who have, have, have shared in that experience. And if, you, if you've been there, you know, like, like I've had the privilege to be in places like the Arctic Life Refuge or the Tongass, these, these are all the life-altering experiences. I mean, the way the wilderness touches you from a spiritual side, um, you know, it stays with you and you want to share that. But so many others, uh, including many of you in this room, may not have been. But you still share that passion for protecting these last great wildernesses, the wildlife that depend on them, the, um, just the belief that there ought to be some places left as they always have been. And again, being amongst all of you tonight, uh, this incredibly special group of people is, is truly energizing. Um, <coughs> now, the, even as much as it's energizing, it was energizing to be here a year ago, uh, that doesn't mean uh, that there haven't been some tough days and dark moments. And um, just late in 2017 was, was unfortunately such a time. And the United States Congress enacted the Tax Act, which included a mandate for oil leasing in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And as you know, this was done buried in a larger bill, done in a way to avoid a full, fair, and open debate, done in a way to, to avoid the 60 volt threshold that controversial issues normally have to overcome. It was done without a vote in the House of Representatives. It was done at a time when we were experiencing record oil production in the United States, and we're exporting increasing quantities of oil overseas. It was done at a time when Alaska was facing extraordinary climate impacts and nowhere more than in the high Arctic. So it was, a, it was a tough moment. And it could have been easy to, to lose ourselves in anger and frustration and, and despair. But what happened in the weeks and, and months since has been truly extraordinary. Far from being discouraged, you and hundreds of thousands of others have answered the call. You have, in the, in the spirit of Winston Churchill's famous admonition, vowed to fight at every step, at every stage, 
to prevent oil drilling from ever happening in this cherished landscape. More than 700,000 of you in less than two months have weighed in with the Trump administration in opposition to drilling in the Arctic Refuge. You pressed your lawmakers to step up, and more than 130 members of Congress have weighed in against the leasing scheme, including more than 30 senators in recent days. $2.5 trillion worth of investors have sent a signal to the oil companies and the big banks that finance drilling to stay out of the refuge. And your generous donations to Alaska Wilderness League and to our partners have put a strong legal team on the field that's prepared to go to court at each and every step and challenge what is unquestionably a mad rush to drill, skirting the normal environmental rules and laws for the sake of beating a perceived politi a shift in, in, in the politics um, that, that may occur that would, that would make drilling more difficult. So they're, they're on a rush to do this. Now if there is, we are getting closer to the elections, and if there is a change in the House of Representatives, that work, the work that you've done, the work that so many others have done, puts us in a stronger position so that if that moment comes when there's a more sympathetic majority in the House, we're prepared to work with our champions to push through legislation to stop drilling in the refuge, prepared to have oversight hearings, prepared to raise the visibility of the issue in a major way. But let's be clear, the threats are, are upon us and they're real. Uh, the Trump administration, as I said, is, is in a mad rush to drill, and that includes potentially greenlighting seismic exploration in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge this winter. Um, it sounds, does it sound innocuous? They're talking about trucks that bring 90,000 pounds of pressure, 56,000 pound trucks that bring more than 90,000 pounds of pressure on the tundra. I'm talking about 20,000 miles of seismic trails across the entire coastal plain of the Arctic Refuge. Um, hundreds of workers working 24-7 around the clock. This is a major industrial intrusion in the wildest place left in America. And the Trump administration is saying that there's no significant impact and we shouldn't even have to do a full environmental analysis of this. But we're going to fight and we're going to go to court and we're going to make sure they do the environmental reviews that they have to do. But in this terrible scheme and this fight, nothing, and I mean nothing, gives me more hope, and more optimism, and more energy than the opportunity to stand in solidarity with the Gwich'in people, who have relied on the sacred land for their subsistence, and their culture, and their way of life. The Gwich'in have, for a thousand generations, been the caribou people, subsisting off and out 200,000 strong porcupine river caribou herd. In one of the world's most awe-inspiring wildlife spectacles, these caribou traverse hundreds of miles and give birth to their calves on the coastal plain in the Arctic Refuge each and every year. The Gwich'in villages, 15 villages in uh, northeast Alaska and northwest Canada are situated along the micro rabbit herd. In 1988, the chiefs, elders, leaders from these villages came together when the Arctic Refuge is threatened. And they passed a resolution <coughs> to defend the cabin grounds for what they call the sacred place where life begins. This special gathering also led to the creation of a new entity, the Gwich'in Steering Committee, which was empowered to advocate against drilling. And in more than three decades since, the Gwich'in Steering Committee has sent hundreds of leaders to speak about the cause all over the country garden clubs and VFW halls at international gatherings at the United Nations. Uh, they've, they've, um, they've done an amazing job all these years telling their story. Um, at great hardship, you know, leaving their homes, leaving their families, leaving these remote villages to come to far-flung places that were unfamiliar and including the halls of Congress. Along the way, we've not only listened and learned and been inspired to work even harder, we have, I hope, become better people. This past summer, I had a chance to spend some time um, at the most recent Gwich'in gathering. 
and Sitchik in the Northwest Territories with the witch hen. And I observed not just that same commitment that was there in 1988, um, but you know, I. I I observed something else in that room. People weren't on their phones. <laughs> they weren't checking their emails. Um, there was no kind of, let's kind of finish up the point. It was people were truly engaged, truly present, truly sharing what the caribou meant to them and the culture and, um, and the people. And it was, um, it was also um, apparent in the evenings after kind of a full day of business there was dancing and joy and camaraderie and that connection of the people that uh, has this bond of, of deep and rich history. There was incredible respect for their elders and the people that have come before them, and they were always acknowledged. And they always um, led gatherings with prayer and um, wisdom. There was a tremendous uh, sense of a commitment to one another. Um, people who might have been, uh, if, if there was a, someone who had passed in, in another village and there needed to be a collection for a funeral, uh, if there was some need that some individual had, people were helping, even people they didn't know in other villages. But more than anything else, what, what stands out and may just be you know, it's, it's, it's more apparent as an outsider, but is it just deep respect and connection to the land? So tonight we're, we're honoring the Gwich'in Steering Committee with our Voice of the Wild Award, and especially recognizing its strong and truly inspirational leader, Bernadette Tementa. In the face of incredible adversity and carrying the full weight of her people, Bernadette has been a voice of resolve and determination. I've seen her in action. Captivating lawmakers, rallying supporters, and speaking truth to power. She's a friend. She's an ambassador for all that is good and kind and decent. She's a warrior for the cause of keeping drilling rigs out of the cabin grounds and out of these sacred lands. It's my honor, my pleasure, to invite Bernadette to the podium. Bernadette. My name is Bernadette Dementif and I'm from Fort Yukon, Alaska. Um, first, I just want to thank Creator for bringing us here together. I want to thank Tom and Helen for putting this on. This is, um, it really does mean a lot. I want to thank my board members, all our funders, our allies, our friends, and supporters. I want to thank my husband for, because um, without him I wouldn't be able to travel as much as I do. He plays both parents, and uh, I know that's a lot on him. There's, there's so much more to this work than just me. I can't take the credit, because I get the knowledge from my elders. All the prayers come from them. All the direction that I get comes from them. I just got a big mouth. I just know how to use it. <laughs> I want to thank my mother-in-law for coming with me down here. We, um, I just lost my grandfather, and so the rest of my family are back home. And he was 94, and he has had a very long life, and I just want to honor him also. My elders, Gideon, Mary Snowshoe, um, tremble all of the all of them they provide all this knowledge that I have when I was young I didn't always take the time to understand or to learn I did lose my way and I feel that 
As soon as I went back up to Deshanle, it's a mountain in Arctic village, it's my ancestral homeland. I truly feel that I have found who I am again. I found my identity as a Kuch'in woman.